Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to Chapter 25 Urinary System. Um, I wanted to show you a side by side. So here's an enlarged kidney, and then here's our torso, here's our diaphragm. And remember, our kidneys are much higher than we think, right? They're at about the floating ribs 11 and 12. Um, and then I wanted you to take a look at the ureters or ureters, however you want to say it, that lead to the bladder. And you can see that this is just a long tube that extends in the abdominal cavity. And then we have our bla urinary bladder, which is our storage tank. And then eventually when we talk about excreting urine, we'll talk about the urethra. I wanted to show you there's a lot going on inside the kidney. Um, there's specific areas like renal pyramids, and then there's renal columns. And then inside here, we're going to have nephrons. And nephrons, it's basically the tube system that's responsible for the absorption and secretion of nutrients or the excretion that are going to turn into waste. So basically, once we get here, once we get into these collection tubes, which we'll call calyces, once we have fluid or filtrate here, it's destined to become urine. So really the absorption is happening up here, and we'll take a look at that in more detail. Some basic definitions, just make sure you understand the kidney's function. It's your major excretory organ for liquid waste, right? We also need to know the ureters or ureters, the urinary bladder, the urethra. In this image, you can see the renal artery and the renal vein. Um, helium is the term we saw earlier when we talked about respiratory. It's just where these vessels enter, right? So uh, renal artery, renal veins, you should know both of those and be able to identify them. Um, the kidneys, the uh, ureters, the urinary bladder, the urethra. When we look at this kidney function list, it's kind of overwhelming, right? Your kidneys are doing a lot for you. So they're regulating your total water volume and total solute concentration, specifically those ion concentrations. So when I say ion concentrations, hopefully we're thinking about things like potassium and sodium. Um, and you can see how the water and the solute would be linked because remember when we talked about blood pressure, we said wherever sodium goes, water follows, right? They're co-transported that we'll talk about a little bit later in this lecture. So it regulates the total water volume, the total solute concentration, the amount of ions then that would be in the extracellular fluid. It ensures long-term acid-base balance. We're going to talk more about this in chapter 26, but it has to do with that carbonic acid, right? When you break down carbonic acid, you've got these hydrogen ions and these bicarbonate ions, and we can release these in urine to adjust the pH of our blood to keep it in that 7.35-7.45 range. Also, it's going to excrete metabolic waste, toxins, any drugs. Um, remember hormones. Go back and look at these again. Remember that EPO is produced by the kidneys to help regulate how many red blood cells you're creating. And then renin. Remember renin regulates blood pressure by the angiotensin 2. Right, creates angiotensin II, which then does what? Goes and triggers aldosterone secretion, and then that's going to cause us to reabsorb more sodium and then reabsorb more water. Um, it can also play a role in activating vitamin D, and remember, it can help carry out gluconeogenesis if needed. So lots of stuff going on here with the kidneys. Make sure that we understand this term, retroperitoneal, right? So these, the kidneys sit outside of the peritoneal cavity. This is good because all the organs that are inside the peritoneum, that would be the stomach, the intestines, right? All the organs that are responsible for digesting food and have lots of bacteria or hydrochloric acid, things like that, right? The right kidney is a little bit lower than the left kidney. Remember, we've got our adrenal glands sitting on top. Here's that term helium again. Um, leads to the renal sinus, and I'll show you this in just a second. And then we have our ureters or ureters, we have our blood vessels, we also have lymphatics, and we have nerves that are going to enter and exit at the helium. Remember, helium is just that entry and exit point of the organ. Here's another good um, figure from your textbook showing you that the kidneys are 
basically sitting directly anterior to the uh, T11 and 12 or the floating ribs. Here you can see that the right and the left don't quite line up. Um, and again, we've already seen the ureters, ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. With the kidneys, we have three layers of supportive tissues. So we have a renal fascia. This is kind of an anchoring connective tissue layer. Then we're going to have a fat capsule, kind of this fatty cushion. And then we're going to have a fibrous capsule that prevents infection to the kidney. I think this is a really nice image to kind of see all the different layers. So first let's look at the peritoneal cavity. So in here would be all your digestive organs. And so I think this is a good example to show you that the kidneys sit retroperitoneal. The other thing is you can see the renal arteries coming in, renal veins going out, and they don't have it highlighted here, but remember the renal helium is just the entry and exit point um, at the organ. So then here's the renal fascia. Um, you can see it posted. It's kind of hard to see, but it's this, this line right here that goes all the way around. So this is a connective tissue layer. It's kind of separating um, the, the kidneys from the rest, or if you want to say anchoring the kidneys to the rest of the either the cavity or the peritoneal cavity. You can see here the fat capsule. So there's fat here and here all around the kidney, kind of offering protection, but it's also offering stability. So if you lose too much of this fat, it can cause your kidneys to kind of slip a little bit. So there's really not much holding them in place other than the other organs and some of this connective tissue. And then we have the fibrous capsule that's directly on top of the kidney. So fibrous capsule, is touching kidney. So some clinical um, issues that can arise because of the anatomy of the kidneys, if you have ra rapid weight loss and some of that fatty tissue, that perirenal uh, fatty capsule, if that starts to degrade or break down, if you're using it to fuel the body, it can cause one of the kidneys to drop or both to a lower position. And if that happens, you might get a kink in the ureter. So remember you have your kidney and then you have your ureter coming down here to your bladder. Well, if this drops, what happens if it kinks right here? That can cause a backup of urine into the kidneys. And you can imagine if you have a backup of fluid, then the kidneys are not going to be able to do many of their functions, right? We also have these distinct regions within the kidneys. So we have cortex. By now we should know this is kind of the outer region, the medulla, which would be the middle region. And then we have this renal pelvis. It's kind of this funnel shaped section of tube and it serves as a collection point. Here we have the cortex all the way around here. Then we have the medulla. That's all of this middle part. And then the renal pelvis, you can see here, is a collection point that leads to the ureter. We have more structures, minor calyces and major. Um, just one is calyx. So if you see this, it just means one. Calyces is plural. And I want to kind of look at the flow of urine. We're going to kind of start off in baby steps. Before we get to the nephron, let's just look at the collection points. So here, we haven't talked about this yet, but this is the renal pyramid, right? And you can see the renal pyramid dumps into these minor calyces. So minor, minor. So this is minors. And do you see how two minors merge into a major? So I'm going to use R for minor and M for major. So this is a minor, 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 minor. Do you see how they all merge? So that has to be a major. So minor calyces drain into a major and then all of the majors drain into the renal pelvis. So if I had to do a flow right now, just starting with what we know, I would say minor calyx, right? So one minor calyx, two would be 
major calyx, three would be renal pelvis, and then after renal pelvis we get to the ureter or ureter, so that would be four. We've got some stuff going on up here that we have to talk about and we'll add to this list. We also have some more clinical issues that can happen. Uh, pileatitis, this is infection of just the collection points, or you can have inflammation of the entire kidney. So this is a pileonephritis. I've got to say that one a little slower, right? Um, you could have swelling of the kidney. You could have an abscess formation. If it's left untreated, it can damage the kidney permanently. We're going to look at the blood and the nerve supply, but I just want to make sure that you know the major one. So I don't have anything really highlighted on here. We're going to go to the next couple slides and look at some of these. You definitely need to know renal artery, right? So this is what's delivering the blood that we're going to clean. So about a fourth of the cardiac output to the kidneys each minute. So basically your kidneys are cleaning 25% of your blood each minute. So they got, they've got a hard job to do, right? Um, and we're going to see how renal arteries um, and blood pressure are detected and we're going to talk about some changes that happen. So the arterial flow, you're going to have a renal artery, and then you're going to have a segmental artery, an interlobular artery, and the list goes on, right? I'm going to show you where these are, but we don't have to know the entire flow for artery um, or, or vein. There are nerves, obviously, right? These are going to be sympathetic, and they're going to form the renal plexus. So basically, if we need to shut down um, urine formation, that would be triggered by fight or flight, so that should kind of make sense. Another image from the textbook, so let's just look at the renal artery. So the blood's coming in, and the blood is going out here to the cortex, which is where the real action is happening. We do have some capillaries here that we'll talk about in the medulla, but really the cortex is kind of the main main delivery of blood. I think your textbook says about 90% of the blood that enters um, the renal artery, artery is delivered to the cortex. I know this seems a little complex. I have highlighted the ones that we really have to know. So that green um, you know, highlight that's there, it's there for a reason. So blood comes off of the abdominal aorta, right, off of the renal artery to the kidneys. Then it travels through these smaller arteries. And really the player that we need to look at is this afferent arterial. And the afferent arterial, this should tell you smaller, right? This is going to lead to the glomerulus. This is the capillary bed. This is where we decide what we're going to drop off and then what's going to be pushed back into the vein. So I'll show you in just a second, but the afferent, I'm going to say afferent arterial, comes into this capillary, and the little stuff, I'm going to say stuff for right now, goes through. Anything really large is going to be kicked back through the efferent arterial, picked up by capillaries, and dumped back into the inferior vena cava. You'll notice um, this is probably the only capillary bed where we go from an arteriole back to an arteriole. What did we normally have, right? We had arteriole goes to capillary and then goes to venule. We don't have venule here. We have our afferent arterial delivering blood to the glomerulus. Magic is going to happen at the glomerulus. Big stuff's going to get kicked out, and it's going to go to an a, excuse me, efferent arterial. So this entering, this exiting, picked up by other capillaries here, and then dumped into inferior vena cava. So this, this is a little convoluted, right? We have two sets of capillaries. Um, we have two arterioles. It's not quite as easy as what we've seen previously. Let's look at the blood flow. So we know we had to come in, right? We had the aorta, and then we came in the renal artery, and then we went through some of these smaller arteries. Now we finally get here to this section right here, which is an afferent arterial. Or you can follow the blood up here. Little branch comes off. What is it? Afferent arterial. Then we go to this tuft of capillaries. This is the glomerulus. And then we get kicked out 
the efferent arteriole. So same thing happening here, afferent going in, tough of capillaries, efferent coming out. The second thing that I want you to look at is this whole thing is what we're going to talk about next. These are both nephrons. So nephrons are basically a tube system, and then you're going to have some sort of capillary wrapped around. We're going to go into more detail, but first we need to look at the terms, right? So there's about a million of these per kidney. These nephrons have two main parts. So the first thing they have is the glomerulus, which is the tuft of capillaries I keep talking about. And then we have the bowl that they're in, which is the glomerulus capsule. So it's this tuft of capillaries sitting in a bowl. Together, so if I take A and B and add them together, we call it a renal corpuscle. So if I said name this, you're going to tell me it's a renal corpuscle. If I said just name this, glomerulus capsule. Just name this, glomerular capillaries or glomerulus. Then we have the renal tube section. We have the proximal convoluted tubule. We have the distal, distal convoluted tubule. And then we have something called the nephron loop. It used to be called the loop of Henle. So if you see that term, that's what they're talking about as well. More explanation here, glomerulus, tuft of capillaries, they're fenestrated. If you remember, the fenestrated have holes in them, right? Highly porous. Um, they're going to allow for filtrate formation. We'll talk more about filtrate here. Plasma-derived fluid that renal tubules process to form urine. So I'll show you in the image and I'll clarify what when it's filtrate, when it's urine, when it's just plasma coming from the blood, right? So if I take this, the glomerulus capillaries, or you can just call it glomerulus, and two, the glomerular capsule, the cup-shaped hollow structure that surrounds the glomerulus, if I add these two together, we call it a renal corpuscle. Okay, so here's our glomerulus, our tuft of capillaries. Here's our glomerular capsule. Both of those together make up the renal corpuscle. Remember, we have blood going in here at the afferent, and we have blood exiting at the efferent. So what's going to happen is the blood's going to come into the glomerulus, and some of the particles, some of the solutes, some of the water, is going to enter into the capsule. It's kind of like being filtered. All of the larger items are going to be kicked back into the efferent arteriole. So proteins, we don't want red blood cells, right? We don't want to break those down and release them in our urine. So the large proteins, red blood cells, those things are going to be not be filtered through the glomerulus and they're going to be kicked back into the efferent arteriole. And then off of the capsule here, off of the glomerular capsule, we have the proximal convoluted tubule. Why is it proximal? It's closest to the renal corpuscle. Then we have this nice loop, nephron loop, or loop of Henle was its old name. And then we have the distal convoluted tubule. Why is it distal? It's the furthest away from the glomerulus or the renal corpuscle. And then we have this item called the collecting duct. People will debate whether the collecting duct is part of the nephron or not. I believe our textbook says it is, so we will just say this is this whole thing is a nephron. Let's look a little closer at the proximal convoluted tubule. So it's closest to the renal corpuscle. It has cuboidal cells and some microvilli. And this should clue you into something about absorption, right? Cuboidal cells, maybe something about secretion. So proximal convoluted tubule not only reabsorbs solutes, but it can also secrete. Um, it's confined to the cortex, and the filtrate from the glomerular capsule drains into the proximal convoluted tubule. So this is the first time we're calling it filtrate. The nephron loop has a descending limb and an ascending limb, and this is kind of the most important part of this nephron loop or loop of Henle. It functions in water absorption by increasing sodium. 
Then we have our distal convoluted tubule. It's the farthest away from the renal corpuscle. Doesn't have as many microvilli. Functions much more in secretion than reabsorption. It's confined to the cortex. It drains into the collecting duct. What's the collecting duct? It receives filtrate from many nephrons. The ducts fuse together and deliver urine to the minor calyces. So a couple of points. When it comes in through the afferent arteriole, it's blood. And if you want to say blood plasma, that's fine. What happens as soon as it drops into the glomerular capsule? If it filters through the glomerulus and drops into the glomerular capsule, we now call it filtrate. And it's filtrate all the way through the tube system. So filtrate here, this is proximal convoluted tubule. We're doing absorption and secretion. Here in the nephron loop, we're really focusing on water absorption or secretion. And then we have our distal convoluted tubule, and this is more focused on secretion than it is reabsorption. So kind of the way I think about this is the proximal, so drop the blood off, right? Um, so I'm going to say small stuff. Small stuff gets through, right? That's solutes, water, right? It goes to the proximal convoluted tubule, and we're going to reabsorb the stuff that we need. Then we get to the nephron loop, and we're going to reabsorb water. And then we get to the distal convoluted tubule, and we get rid of any last little thing. Secretion, let me spell, right? We get rid of anything extra that we have, and then once it enters the collecting duct, it's destined to become urine. So even though the proximal convoluted tubule does both reabsorption and some secretion, it might be better if you think of what it does mostly, right? So all the small stuff comes through. We reabsorb in the proximal convoluted tubule anything that we might want to keep, like sodium, potassium, calcium, right? Then we come down to the loop of Henle, and we worry about, do we need to keep water, or do we need to get rid of water? And then we come to the distal, and it's kind of like the last minute. Oh, yeah, by the way, we have too much of this. Let's get rid of it. And then once we get to the collecting duct, what they're trying to show you here is that several nephrons are dumping into the collecting duct. So this is a collection point. That's why it's called a collecting duct, right? And where's the collecting duct going to go to? Its very first collection point is that minor calyx. So our nephron is up here, right? We have our renal corpuscle, we have our proximal, we have our loop of Henle, we have our distal, and we have our collecting duct. That's going to dump into a minor. And then from a minor, you're going to dump into a major. And then from the major, you're going to dump into the renal pelvis. So I would go through this and make sure that I could start with the nephron and do each section of the nephron, right? So do the renal corpuscle, that's the glomerulus and the glomerulus capsule, or excuse me, capillaries. So the whole thing is renal corpuscle, right? Then it goes, what, proximal convoluted tubule? Then a nephron loop. I almost called it loop of Henle. It's hard when you've been doing it for so long, right? Then distal convoluted tubule. Then woo, collecting duct. Then where do you go? Minor calyx, then you go major, ooh, major calyx, then we go renal pelvis. What's after renal pelvis? Yay! Ureter, and then see if you can follow it all the way to the external urethral orifice. There are two types of nephrons, um, and it kind of depends on their location. So we have cortical nephrons. These are the majority of the nephrons. When we talk about nephrons, we're usually talking about cortical nephrons. They're almost entirely in the cortex except for that loop. Then we have the juxtamedullary nephrons. These have really, really long loops that invade deep into the medulla.
and they're really important in concentrating urine. So let's take a look. Here's a cortical nephron. This kind of is like a division line. If this, this artery, um, anything above is cortex, below is medulla. So what do you notice about the cortical nephron? It's mostly in the cortex. We can see this tiny little loop, uh, nephron loop here. And then the difference, what do you notice about this juxtamedullary nephron? It's mostly in the medulla. We have this really, really long loop of Henle in the medulla. So these guys are about 85%. These are about 15%. Another thing to notice are the capillaries. So if you can see here, we have the afferent, maybe I can use green, maybe that'll help, I don't know. Yeah. So here's the afferent arterial coming in. Here's the glomerulus. He's, here's the efferent coming out, efferent arterial. And then we can see we have capillary bed. These capillaries are interwoven through the proximal so this is the proximal, the section here, proximal convoluted tubule. And then we have our loop, and then we have our distal convoluted tubule. So that's kind of on this side over here. So these uh, capillaries are called peritubular capillaries. Do you see how they're all wrapped around the tube? That's why they call it peritubular. Over here with the juxtamedullary nephron, we only see the capillary wrapped around the loop of Henle. You see how there's no capillary here? So that's why they said the juxtamedullary plays a really important role in water reabsorption, right? Well, why is that? Because the loop of Henle or the nephron loop is responsible for water reabsorption. And we have this called vasa recta. Remember, this means straight right, straight vessels, so they're kind of more straight. So we have two different types of nephrons, cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons, and then we have two different types of capillaries wrapped around those nephrons. So cortical nephrons always have peritubular, and juxtamedullary nephrons always have uh, vasa recta. We can see here a little more information about peritubular. They're under low pressure. Um, they arise from the efferent arterial. They wrap around the tubules, right? The proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. And they're important in the absorption of water and solutes. Um, they're eventually going to empty into veins. So kind of going back to our original, we had aorta, we had our renal, we had several other arteries, then we get to afferent, arterial, right? Then we go to glomerulus, then we go to efferent, arterial. In this case, then we go to peritubular capillaries, and they're saying the peritubular will eventually empty into venules. So we're kind of going through two capillaries before we eventually make our way into a venule and then eventually inferior vena cava. Uh, wrapped around the juxtamedullary nephrons, we have the vasar vasa recta capillaries. Um, these are going to function in the formation of concentrated urine. I believe we're not going to talk about it till part two, but I'll show you uh, kind of what's happening in these capillaries and whether we're going to have concentrated urine or whether we're going to have dilute urine. Next, we need to talk about juxtaglomerular complex or apparatus. Um, this is kind of the older name, but people still say JGA. There's one per nephron, and we've got to come back to fun, fun regulation and hormonal regulation to be specific. So this uh, JGA complex is important for the regulation of filtrate formation and blood pressure. So remember, you have blood coming into the glomerulus, right, those capillaries, blood coming in, and then 
from whatever in the blood drips through the capillary, those fenestrated capillaries, whatever comes through, we now call that filtrate. So I'm going to draw my little capsule and then my glomerulus capillary. So do you think the pressure of the blood being dumped into the glomerulus could affect the filtrate? And hopefully by now we're saying yes, right? So we know how blood pressure can affect um, the flow of solutes and water. We've already talked about this with capillary beds, but it does make a difference. And so the kidneys need to control for that, right? We need to be able to have homeostasis. We need to be able to adapt um, or cause uh, negative feedback, cause opposite actions to happen. In the juxtaglomerular apparatus, we have macula densa cells and granular cells. And these misogynal cells kind of help these two communicate. So it says it might allow for the passing of signals between the macula densa and the granular cells. So we're going to focus on these two. The macula densa contain chemoreceptors that sense sodium chloride or salt concentration. So basically, those macula densa cells, we'll see the image in just a second, the macula densa cells are monitoring the sodium chloride um, amount or concentration inside the filtrate. So basically if the sodium or the salt concentration is too high, it probably says that filtration isn't happening efficiently. You're supposed to reabsorb the salt. We want the sodium reabsorbed usually. So if your sodium chloride concentration is really high, it probably means something's happening with uh, reabsorption. It's not happening as efficiently. So the macula densa is monitoring the amount of solutes in your filtrate. Secondarily, the granular cells these are smooth muscle cells of the arterial. So if we think of smooth muscle, we're probably going to think of some sort of constriction or dilation, right? They're mechanoreceptors, and they sense blood pressure differences. They can also initiate the release of renin, which will eventually turn on aldosterone, right? So you have two sets of cells, one that's managing kind of the efficiency of reabsorption and another one that's managing the blood pressure going into the glomerulus. So basically overall you want your glomerular filtration rate, something we'll talk about eventually, but you want the blood flowing through your kidneys at a steady state. If it's too high or too low, you're not going to be able to efficiently reabsorb the nutrients that you need or get rid of the excesses that you don't need. Here's an image of the juxtaglomerular apparatus or complex. So it's all kind of here. So the macula densa cells, that's these guys. What are they doing? The macula densa ones are looking at sodium chloride concentration in this tube. So in the filtrate. Is the sodium chloride concentration too high? Do we need to worry about uh, whether the blood, blood pressure is too high or too low? Do we need to worry about the filtrate as it's coming through? Then we have the granular cells, and the granular cells are here and here. And these granular cells are looking at pressure differences. So as the blood is flowing through the afferent arterial, if the blood pressure is too high or the blood pressure is too low, the granular cells are looking at that. They're mechanoreceptors that respond to pressure. And these granular cells can release renin. And what does renin do? Angiotensin 2 and aldosterone. I know we hate these endocrine hormones, right? Then we reabsorb sodium, then we reabsorb water. So um, and then here are the, the extra cells that they think talk to each other. So it allows the macula densa cells and the granular cells to kind of talk to each other, compare notes. Is the blood pressure really high? Is my filtrate too concentrated? The purpose of this slide is to see how busy your kidneys are and how important they are and how much they're working for you nonstop, even if you don't know it. 180 liters of fluid are processed daily.
So we're talking blood plasma, right, goes into the kidney. And we're saying what goes in? 180 liters. What comes out as urine is only 1.5. So that should tell you that there is tons of reabsorption happening, right? We're reabsorbing the majority of what we filtered through the kidneys. So the kidneys filter the body's entire plasma volume 60 times each day. And we consume a lot of oxygen to do this because we got to make ATP to run some of these uh, protein pumps that are going to reabsorb. And we'll talk about this in the next video. So even though 25% of your blood gets diverted to the kidney at a time, right? We can't take all of the blood. That would be bad for the rest of the body, right? So 25% gets pushed into the kidneys. We recycle it. But how many times does that happen each day? So basically 25% of your blood is run through your kidneys 60 times in a day. The filtrate is the blood plasma minus the proteins. So remember the blood comes in, we have the capsule, we have the tuft of capillaries, the glomerulus. So we're saying once the blood comes in, what comes out is filtrate. What gets kicked back into the efferent arteriole, that's anything that's a protein. So like albumin that's in our blood, uh, red blood cells, that gets kicked back out the efferent arteriole. So blood goes into the glomerulus. What drips through the glomerulus is now called filtrate. And urine, less than 1% of that filtrate actually becomes urine. So I want you to think about this. If we put the blood, push the blood through the glomerulus and we get out this filtrate, and what's in the filtrate? It's all the small stuff, right? It's water, solutes. So we're saying all of this initial filtrate from the glomerular capsule, less than 1% of what we filtered through actually gets turned into urine and waste. Again, that should tell you there's lots of reabsorption happening. So we basically let all of the small stuff fall through the glomerulus, and then we reabsorb the majority of it and only release the stuff that we don't need as urine. This seems like a lot of work, and it is, and we'll go through it in more detail in the next video.